let's talk about gear surfaces and materials. Now, first of all, let it be known that entire PhDs and postdoctoral theses have been written about this. Well, frankly, there have been entire careers that have been built around this subject. So the idea that I'm going to do it justice in the next five minutes or so is pretty ludicrous. We're just going to take a very cursory look as to how gear surfaces and materials relate to lubricants and lubrication regimes and what some of the choices that we need to make around that. Now, the reason why this is such a challenge and such a varied subject is think about all the different gear applications. You've got something like a watch, very precise, very small. Then you've got, let's say, for example, a bicycle you know, chain and sprocket. Then there's automotive gear drives. Then you've got so, sort of an industrial gearbox. Then bigger still, we've got wind turbine gearboxes. And then right at the top of the tree, you've got something like, you know, the gears that are, that are on a, a ball mill at a mine. Because there's so many different applications, it stands to reason that there are many different materials and manufacturing processes that we can use to, to make gears, right? It's just so varied. So in order to understand this, we need to really go back to our trusty friend, the Strybeck curve, right? Again, it's talking about those three lubrication regimes. There's boundary, there's mixed, and there's hydrodynamic. And in an ideal scenario with gears, we want to be in this hydrodynamic lubrication regime. What that means is that there is sufficient film thickness to completely separate the two gear surfaces. So if you can imagine that as two gears are trying to mesh together, there's a normal force which is trying to squeeze those surfaces together. So for them to be fully separated, the fluid film has to develop sufficient internal pressure that it can exert an equal and opposite force back on those gear teeth such that it can separate them out. And what that means is that as they slide past each other, then you don't get contact between the, the peaks of the surface finish, right? Because remember, no gear tooth is perfectly smooth. Now, how does this relate to gear manufacturing and gear materials? Well, ultimately, if we can smooth out that surface finish because we have used a different manufacturing method, then what it effectively means is that we can use a thinner lubricant film and we can still get that separation between the two surfaces. So this is why gear manufacturing becomes really important. It become, becomes important to understand how a gear was manufactured so that we can choose the correct lubricant. But it also means that we need to keep in mind as the, the gear starts to degrade and wear, that's also going to affect the surface finish as well. And maybe we want to start making different choices about our lubricants, um, our thickness, and maybe even the way that we lubricate a gear as it ages. Now, if we talk about gear manufacturing, there's many, many different ways that we can classify all the different gear manufacturing methods. Um, I'm going to use just kind of one way of classifying it, which breaks everything up into mass manufacturing, casting, forging, and machining processes. So when I talk about mass manufacturing, I'm really talking about something that enables mass production of gears on like a massive scale and where you're not really looking for a degree of accuracy or high surface finish. So that'd be things like stamping or extrusion, where you can basically stamp out a whole bunch of gears, you know, one after the other. That would be used in cases where you don't need very good tolerances. Then you move on to something like casting. Now, there's obviously different types of, of casting metals, but generally you'll know that if you make a, a, a sand cast material, it generally doesn't have a good, very good surface finish and we then got to go through some extra machining process to get that surface finish a little bit better. Then you move on to something like forging, right? Forging is a little bit different from casting in so, in so much as it's not a molten metal, right? We're working the metal into shape. And generally where you'll see forging applied in gear materials is basically they forge a blank, right? And then they use that blank and then they machine it into a, a gear surface. Now, the reason I'm putting the, the open gear picture up on the screen is that this is a classic example of choosing between casting and forging, right? So these gears can be up to like 15 meters in diameter. They are absolutely massive. And the two general ways that they're made are either casting or forging. Now, obviously, you're not going to you forge like, like a blacksmith and hammer out uh, a girth gear that's 15 meters in diameter. That would be ludicrous. Where forging comes into it is that they forge the blank material. That material then gets rolled into shape and then they machine the teeth. Whereas something with casting, for example, they can cast basically the entire 
uh, you know, gear set in one go, and then they machine out the surface finish, right? So you're making choices about the, the type of material that you want to use, because again, the steels that are cast versus forged are quite different, and the machining methods are, uh, that are used as well. Then you go on to machining, and there's a whole bunch of different machining methods. You've got milling, hobbing, broaching, and shaping. And in broad ways, we can categorize them as milling and hobbing are kind of created through a tool that uses rotation, right? So you can see here the hob, which is the gear that cuts, is the one on the left, right? And so milling is very similar, except that there's only really one tooth that's doing cutting, and you have to re-index the, the blank each time. Then you've got broaching and shaping, which are more kind of linear methods. So they're scraping up and down a little bit like a, a piston within an engine to try and uh, cut out that tooth, right? So that's what broaching and shaping are a little, a little bit more similar to. So again, you'll get different surface finishes based on the manufacturing process. Then after you've actually manufactured the gear, sometimes it will go through a finishing process, right? Like if we want a better surface finish, you'll go through you know, a, a grinding or a shaving, honing or a lapping process, right? So often what we're, we're doing is we're either using, you know, very, very fine, it's kind of the equivalent of going from a really coarse sandpaper to a very si fine sandpaper, right? We're abrading it with very fine materials to get a, a really polished surface finish. And then when we go to something like lapping, we're actually using, uh, you know, a, a compound to try and smooth out that surface finish over a really long period of time. Now, AGMA, which is the American Gear Manufacturers Association, they actually give us kind of um, guidance as to the kind of surface finish that you can expect based on different manufacturing processes. So as an example, if we were to just sand cast a gear, then one, um, lower numbers here are not as, not as high quality surface finish. So in, in just a, a regular sand cast gear, we can expect very, very poor surface finish quality. And then if we have a little bit of care about what we do maybe we can get the score to like a, a three or something like that but if you compare that with a standard milling manufacturing process or a hobbing manufacturing process there you know we can get a score of usually eight and if we take a little bit of care with it then we can get to a 13 and then of course as you start to get into the gear finishing processes you know with lapping for example and using those compounds we can get a very very high degree surface finish now, let's briefly talk about materials because that's it's a whole own subject, right? Within the materials for gears, you can really, with the metal gears that is, because remember some gears can be made out of plastic too, um, you can basically group them into, into three, let's say very, very broad groups. You've got the steels, you've got the alloys, and then the others. Now, when I say other, that incorporates all kinds of things, but one of the common uh, applications would be something like in worm gears where... Um, you've got the worm and the worm wheel. The wheel is often some kind of yellow metal compound, like a brass or a bronze or something like that. And that's often used because the amount of sliding that occurs between the worm and the worm wheel is much greater than between other types of gear sets, right? If we had uh, two different hardened steels, there would be too much wear in that combination. So it, that's why it's often a brass or a bronze on the worm wheel. Then with steels, we generally have two different types, right? We've got through hardened and case hardened. Um, through hardened was probably more popular, you know, a few decades ago. These days, it's probably more the norm that you see uh, gears that are case hardened. And really, the, there's only you can't really tell whether something is through hardened or case hardened just by, by looking at it. Um, but if you see a cross section, it's very easy to tell, right? So... Um, you know, something that's case hardened will be very obviously a, a different kind of grain structure at the tooth surface. And then, of course, you've got the alloying materials as well, of which there are many, many different types. And we haven't even gone into other metals that are used to make gears. There are plenty of aluminium gears out there, for example. So anyway, this has been very, very uh, quick introductory session. But hopefully what I've impressed upon you is really the fact that manufacturing processes and the materials themselves have an impact on the choices that you want to make when it comes to your lubricant.